Well, all right, we can begin once again. Um, the when oh hi when the no when the when the break time came everyone vanished so quickly i mean i don't think even the rapture will take place that fast so you know after we finish don't do that you know um, amazing vanishing act like just stick around for a minute or two so that i can talk about the i know assignment which you know because you it would be a written assignment you know, if you can just stick around for a few seconds and I give me a chance to talk. Okay, so uh, yeah. All right, let's uh, move on. So we were, we were able to you know talk about the Old Testament canon and kind of get an idea of how it must have come together, how the Lord would have spoken to them from time to time and say, you know, write down my words and then someone would have written it down and then they would have carefully preserved it. So all of that took place over a period of time and around 435 B.C., uh, you know, the Old Testament was finalized. And so writings which were written in the 200s, um, uh, second century BC, like you know, around 200, 250 BC, uh, those writings were not regarded as scripture. So you have many books which were written at that time, you know, Book of Tobit, Book of Judith, uh, Book of Sirach, um, you know, so these are all other books which were written around 250 BC, 200 BC, uh, and, and around that time. So when the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek was being done, you know, it, it was those 70 elders who came together and they sat down and they did the translation work to convert the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek language, simply because many of the people were no longer familiar with uh, reading and writing in Hebrew. I'm sure at home they still spoke in Hebrew with one another. But when it came to reading and writing, uh, now people were using the official language. They were using Greek. So uh, the spiritual leaders realized that it would be good if the Hebrew scriptures can be translated into Greek, then at least the people can continue to know the scriptures. They can continue to read in the Greek language. So the translation took place, I think probably around, um, maybe around uh, 150 years before the uh, birth of Christ, probably. I need to find out my dates. I don't remember exactly. So, but whenever that uh, translation was done, the people who were doing the translation work, they not only translated the canonical Old Testament books, but they also translated some of these, you know, the book of Tobit and the book of Judith and the book of Sirach and all of that. So when you look at your Septuagint, which is the you know name which is given to the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you not only find the Old Testament books translated into Greek, you also tend to see some of these other books mentioned, but these are not Old Testament canon. And when we see Jesus coming along, you know, I'm sure he also would have read from the Septuagint. He was familiar with Hebrew. He, you know, because he was after all, you no, know, he um, well versed in the scriptures. I'm sure he would have specialized in Hebrew and, you know, read it and written it but he was also familiar with Greek. So he would have also read the Septuagint, but you never see him quoting even once from these other books. We don't find any quotations from Tobit or Judith or Sirach or any of the other books. So we also must take care to make sure that we differentiate between inspired word of God and the other writings. These books of Tobit and Judith and all are good books. Well, at least most of it is good. Some of it is a little strange and you wonder, my goodness, is this in any way um, in line with what we believe in? So, okay, so all of it cannot be accepted. But some of it is just good writing, you know, uh, but it is not inspired word of God. And we need to kind of, you know, maintain that distinction. All right. Um, now, when people were writing these things, 
you know, uh, during that time, you know, around 200 BC, 250 BC, around that time when they were writing these things, um, they also wanted to add something to the scrolls which were already written, like for instance, Book of Daniel. They wanted to add a few extra passages to the Book of Daniel. The same way with Esther, Book of Esther, they added some additional details to the Book of Esther. But we don't accept those as canonical, as inspired word of God, because these were later additions. At that time when the original writer was inspired to write, God did not say those things. These were things which were added many hundreds of years later. And so it would be wrong for us to regard those extra additions as scripture. Okay, so even though we have a you know a passage, some passages in uh, the book of Daniel about how these three men go into the fiery furnace, and you know while they are in the furnace, Abednego is supposed to have you know said this long prayer, and uh, that's an additional writing. So we don't really know whether he actually said a prayer in there or not, uh, but this is long prayer of Abednego, which is written, uh, which is an which is an additional uh, writing, which was written much later. There's also this uh, this a song of the three Jews. So all these three people inside the furnace were supposed to have sung a song, or, or maybe they sang a song after coming out of the furnace. Don't really remember the details, but you know these are all extra things which were added to the original scrolls, and we do not accept the additional uh, writings as uh, scripture. The same way, even with regard to the story of Esther. Uh, there's this long prayer which is written out, which she is supposed to have prayed before going to the king. Okay, that's a later addition. That prayer was written out much later. It was not part of the original writing. So we would not, we will not regard that prayer of Esther as a original writing inspired by God. Um, in the same way, it also talks about how when she goes to the king, she faints. She's so scared that she faints. Now that is not there in the original, um, you know, writing which God gave. So these are all things which we will regard as non-canonical. Okay, so and there's a term that is used for these writings. They are called the apocryphal writings. The word apocrypha literally means something which is hidden, something which is secret. And I'm not very sure why on earth they went and used that particular term for it, because these were very open writings. They were available for anyone to read, anyone who, who knew how to read and write could take those things and read them. The word apocrypha actually talks about secret hidden teachings, which only some special people will know. But there was nothing hidden about these apocryphal writings. They were just simply written out for people to read and they hoped that people would accept them as divine. Uh, but then we do not because uh, we know that they were not part of the original canon. Um, so so the um so yes it is true that uh, the catholic church does regard some of the apocryphal writings as part of scripture uh, but then based on the timeline of these writings we would not accept them because we believe that around 435 bc itself you know whatever god had to say was said and after that god you know um, uh, just like God had warned the people and said, you will long to hear my voice and hear my words and my instruction, but no longer will you hear it because, you know, you have chosen uh, to harden your hearts. So those, so those years of silence began after 435 BC. God did not speak anymore. Just like he warned, he stopped speaking. And we hear his voice next only when John the Baptist comes along and starts proclaiming in the desert and start preparing the way for the Messiah who will be coming. So uh, this is long period of silence. And these writings were written during that period of silence. So we do not regard them as God's words. OK, so um, coming to the New Testament canon. Um, well, uh, if we look at maybe we can read out one or two verses. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 26, if we could have someone read out. John 14, 26. John 14, 26. Do I have the wrong reference? Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so um, when Jesus was with his disciples on the earth, those three years, he taught them many, many things. In those days, um, the rabbi, you know, the teacher would teach his followers, um, you know, many godly things. And uh, they were not very big on writing because they didn't have you no know, notebooks and all that in those days. Uh, and uh, papyrus was something expensive. So you can't just use papyrus for whatever, you know, um, it's expensive. So you just can't write randomly everything that comes into your head. Uh, so um, mainly the followers of any rabbi, what they would do is they would by heart memorize everything that the teacher is saying. The teacher would try to present his teachings in an in a easy way, you know, using um, poetic kind of uh, words, easy to remember kind of words. And they would literally by heart all those teachings. So even Jesus' disciples also would have done that. They would have memorized huge chunks of teachings. And when we look, um, now when these, uh, you know, some of these people who later went on to write the New Testament books, when they wrote, they did not write in, um, in Aramaic. You see, when Jesus and his disciples, when they would have been speaking on a day-to-day -day basis, they would have used Aramaic. Aramaic was the normal language used at that time. Hebrew was like little ancient. Hebrew was no longer spoken at home. Aramaic is what people would generally speak among themselves, you know, in their family circles, among their friends. So Jesus would have done his teaching in Aramaic. Now, when, uh, you know, um, when uh, you have Matthew writing his book, he does not write in Aramaic. He writes it in the Greek language. But what he is doing is in his mind, he's translating whatever he has learned in Aramaic and he's translating it into Greek and writing it down. So someone, one scholar thought it would be very interesting. Let's take all these, you know, the, uh, these writings and translate them back into the original language, Aramaic, because that's what Jesus would have taught him. And when they did the translation, they saw something very interesting. In Aramaic, when you do the translation, the whole wording becomes very easy to memorize. It's like short, short sayings. The wordings are phrased in such a way that it will be easy for you to uh, by heart and remember and repeat again and again. In Greek, that kind of um, uh, sentence construction is not seen. It gets covered up. So when this, uh, when Matthew sat down and wrote you know, his uh, gospel in the Greek language, uh, we don't exactly catch the uh, sentence construction, the original sentence construction. But when we take the Greek wordings and we take them back into the original Aramaic, then we see that the sentence construction becomes very easy to remember because they use certain, um, I don't remember the exact terminology, OK? Um, they used uh, two beat two beat rhythms, three beat rhythms. Jesus is supposed to have used two beat rhythms for, um, I think, for um, um, for warnings. He used three, three beat rhythm wordings for, um, uh, you know, um, teachings uh, on, on how to, um, you know, on, on, on very important matters like salvation and all of that. I can actually look up that and, you know, and um, and let you know because it's interesting. So Jesus very consciously sp spent time thinking, how do I say my teachings in such a way that my disciples are able to memorize it and remember it, and then later on be able to write it down and pass it on to future generations. So he used these two beat rhythms, three beat rhythms, uh, those simple kind of sentence constructions to compose his teachings in such a way that people can memorize them and store them in their hearts and then pass it on to other people. And that's how learning took place. So here what Jesus is telling his people is, you know, the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything that I have taught you. So don't worry. When, when the time comes, you will be able to remember, recollect all that I have taught. And then you will be able to put it down in writing and you will be able to pass it on to future generations. So um, 
that is how the new testament began to be formed when it was first spoken it was spoken verbally and the disciples memorized it and when they were told by jesus you know go into the surrounding villages and minister if you remember he sent uh, sends out the 12 disciples and says go and preach what i have taught you what do you think they went and taught how do you think they prepared their sermons they basically were telling whatever they had memorized from jesus that's basically what they went and spoke in all those villages and then later on when jesus sends out the 70 people and says go forth and preach they what they had what the 70 people had memorized that's basically what they went and shared and so that when it came to the time of writing people like matthew they sat down they translated what they had learned into the greek language and they wrote it out in the greek language so that's so that's basically how uh, you know uh, this process took place and then now uh, if we can also maybe read john chapter 16 verse 13 okay so here jesus says another thing first he told right in john 14 26 the lord said uh, the holy spirit will will remind you of everything that i have said to you and here the lord says to them he uh, the holy spirit will guide you into all truth some of the things which the disciples had memorized they didn't quite understand at that time it's only after jesus died and he was resurrected then they fully understood oh this is what he meant when he said such and such a thing and that is when they got greater clarity and so now when it came to the time of actually writing down the holy spirit helped them to understand the words which they had memorized so this is all involved in the process of the uh, you know composition of the new testament and uh, so finally you have um, you know um, when it comes to the actual writing uh, you have uh, this matthew and john uh, the two disciples whatever they have written down they have written down uh, based on all that the holy spirit has reminded them of what was originally taught by jesus all those things which have they have memorized the holy spirit has brought it back into their minds and then they were able to write down their gospels and also the holy spirit led them into all truth helped them to understand what they had memorized at that time so at certain places they were able to add details that this is the meaning of what jesus said when he spoke those words so so in this way uh matthew and john wrote what about the book of james uh and then what about you know um yeah james uh, you see was a half brother of jesus so he also at that time when jesus was there of course he you know he was not very keen on um, following jesus because his immediate family uh, thought that he was mad they had such a low opinion of him and the ministry that he was doing even though they were seeing all the miracles that he was doing they you know they at one point they come and they say that no he is out of his mind they say that he is uh, you know not in his correct mind that's the opinion they had of him but once jesus died and once he was resurrected the family had to you know accept the fact that a dead person has come back to life after 3 days and so there is no doubt that he is indeed divine and at that point of time james also probably would have learned from the other disciples all the teachings which jesus has taught so james when he is writing his book uh, he would have based it on whatever he has learned from the other disciples and also you know from his own interactions with uh, with with jesus whatever he had learned in the same way peter peter also was someone who was there with jesus so what when when he wrote his uh, epistles he would have based all that he is writing on what jesus has originally taught so these are people who were directly in contact with jesus and so whatever they wrote we can trust that it is uh, truly from jesus that it is truly from god 
we can believe that whatever has been written by these people is divinely inspired. Um, what about Paul? Paul was not there when all these disciples were getting mentored and they were by hearting and memorizing. Paul was not there with them. But Paul, he says something very important. Um, if we can look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Hmm. So he, Paul says something very bold. He says, you know what? This gospel which I am preaching, I did not learn it from the disciples. He, in fact, if you were to look at you know their entire Galatians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 2, he explains in great detail, I did not go to Jerusalem, go to the disciples and learn from them the gospel. Rather, Jesus Christ himself appeared to me by a revelation and personally taught me the gospel. So we are able to accept whatever Paul has written as divinely inspired because Paul clearly says that everything that he wrote is not from human origin. It was not received from any man, nor was he taught by anyone, but by a direct revelation from Jesus Christ. And so all the writings of Paul, we also accept as being divinely inspired. What about Mark and Luke? Mark and Luke were not disciples, but they were in close relationship with the disciples for the simple reason that Mark was the translator for Peter. Wherever Peter would go and do ministry, Mark would go along with him. And so Mark would have learned from Peter all that Jesus has taught. And so when Mark is doing his writing, he would have been very careful to do it in, you know, in line with the Holy Spirit. Um, in the same way, Luke, Luke, even though he was not a disciple, uh, he was in direct connection with Paul. His ministry was in direct connection with Paul because, you know, he on missionary journeys, he traveled along with Paul. Uh, so, so we accept the writings of these people as divinely inspired because either these were all people who were directly in touch with Jesus or they were people who were in direct touch with the disciples of Jesus. Okay, so which is why we consider all of these particular New Testament books as being inspired word of God. Um, and that is why whenever these New Testament writers are writing, they place whatever they are writing on equal grounds uh, uh, with whatever the prophets taught in the Old Testament. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. Uh, Second Peter Chapter 3, verse 2, if we can have someone read out. 2 Peter 3, 2. Yeah. Over here, you know, Peter, he's saying, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets. And the command given by our Lord Jesus, uh, Lord and Savior, through your apostles. So he is saying, whatever the prophet said and whatever the apostles said, please recall both of them because both of them are from God. Both are divinely inspired, is the point that he is making. Um, in the same way, 1 Corinthians 14 37. What does Paul say? 1 Corinthians 14 37. Okay, what I am writing to you are the commandments of the Lord. They are divine, divinely inspired scripture. Another third one, let's look at 2 Peter 3.15. Yes. So how has Paul written? He has written with the wisdom that God gave him. Okay. So based on all of this, we accept these particular books of the New Testament as inspired canon. Okay. So um, we have not talked about Jude. 
Jude is also uh, accepted as uh, divinely inspired scripture because Jude also was a uh, brother of Jesus and he was in close association with James. Okay, so uh, James and Jude, uh, because of their direct association with Jesus and later on with the disciples, uh, we are able to accept their writings also as inspired. In fact, that just leaves us with the book of Hebrews. We do not know who the writer of Hebrews is. Some people say it is Paul, but then some people are not sure. But whoever the author of Hebrews may be, uh, we see um, a very clear comparison between the Old Testament and you know its, its connection to the New Covenant. And so it is accepted as divine scripture because this particular book makes a direct connection between the old cover old testament and what was written over there about uh, the messiah and how that is fulfilled over here you know in the present uh, by whatever jesus christ has done so that entire book of hebrews talks about how jesus christ fulfilled the old covenant and so based on the content of that book and also because uh, the the style of writing is similar to that uh, you know, used by Paul, it is accepted as part of divine scripture. So we can have confidence that whatever we are reading in the Old Testament and in the New Testament was specifically given by the Creator God to humans as His word from His throne to be taken seriously, to be accepted as canon, as the standard which God has set for human beings. So this is the standard which you are meant to follow, you know, if you want to live on this earth. What are the instructions given in this canon? What are we, uh, how are we told to live? Uh, what principles are we supposed to adopt? All that is mentioned, given in that standard which has been set for humans. So we accept this Bible as the canon which will determine all of that. Now coming to another important concept uh, which we would have to look at you know if we are dealing with this doctrine of the word of god it is this whole idea of inspiration now um, when we say inspired word of god are we saying that god literally dictated word by word what ezekiel should write down did god you know sit next to ezekiel and say okay write down first sentence you know write this and then next, or did God just tell him, this is what I want you to write. Now write it down in your own words. And then guided him, inspired him, enabled him as he's writing to write the correct things. So it's not like as if God just left him on his own and said, you know, I, I told you what to write. Now go and write it in your own way, however you want. No, even as the man was sitting there writing, God inspired and enabled him and guided him to put down the correct things. Okay, so when we are saying inspired word of God, we are not talking about dictation as in literally word by word dictation. But at the same time, we are also not saying uh, that, you know, the uh, person was just left to write on their own whatever they wanted. It was all guided by the Spirit. Because why does, what is, you know, um, Earlier we saw in the scripture, right, where um, Peter is talking about Paul's writings and he says, by the wisdom of God, he wrote. You know, that's the wording that is used over there, that he wrote by the um, wisdom of God. Where was that scripture? Yeah, Second Peter 3.15. So in the same way, all the people who wrote their books, they wrote it by the wisdom of God. So we can be uh, sure that whatever has been written is actually correct. Now, why do we say uh, that, you know, so the, there are terms that are used is, um, they say, they call it dynamic uh, writing, as in God gave the thoughts, God gave the concept, and then uh, they were asked to put it down in their own words, so which means whatever they have learned, you know, uh, the style of writing which they have learned, they would be using that. Um, 
they would be using examples from their background, from their culture. So they would be using their style of writing, but the concepts are coming directly from God. And uh, uh, whatever details they have been able to get from the people around them, they would include over there as they are writing. So in, in that sense, there's a local flavor to what is being put down. But the whole thing is being overseen and the whole thing is being supervised by the Holy Spirit himself so that there is no mistake. Um, and so when we look at you know, these Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, some of them, they all mention the same event. Like, for instance, uh, all the four Gospels will talk about the empty tomb, you know, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead. All four of the Gospels will talk about the empty tomb. But look at the way they write it. Each of them writes it differently. Why? Because there is no dictation going on. They have, they all are aware of the of what has happened, and God wants them to write down about it. But they are writing it from their own angle. So some of them will write certain details. Other people will leave out certain details. Some of them will only make one observation, and the other person will make an observation which seems to be slightly different from what the other person has said. So, um, for instance, let's look at um, you know some of the details. If you look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 2 to 5, you know, where it talks about uh, the empty tomb, here it says, there was a violent earthquake for an angel from the Lord came down from heaven. And then it talks about how the angel rolled away the stone. All of those details are given in your book of Matthew. But when you go to Mark, you don't see any of those details. In Mark, it just talks about a young man dressed in a white robe who was sitting on the right side, you know, of the uh, of the you know the the clothes which are laid out over there. Jesus is no longer there, but the burial clothes are still over there. And this young man dressed in a white robe is sitting on the right side of these uh, pieces of cloth. And then when you come to Luke, Luke chapter twenty-four, verse four. There it says, not one man, it says two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. So what happened? Was there one angel or were there two angels? So are we saying that somebody made a mistake? Or are, 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 are we saying that both of them are correct? Let's look at uh, John 20, 11 to 12. There it says, they saw two angels in white seated whereas earlier we saw in luke it says two two men who were standing so were they sitting down or were they standing what's going on here have they made a mistake is this inspired word of god my goodness is there a controversy over here you know those are all the questions which would arise in our minds so we need to kind of understand how this whole thing would have been you know um, composed you see different people would have gone to different uh, eyewitnesses to find out what happened over there. They were not there, right? These people who wrote were not there on that at that empty tomb that day. Who was there? The women. There was a bunch of ladies who went over there. They are the ones who actually saw with their eyes, heard with their ears. They are the actual direct eyewitnesses and ear witnesses. So these other disciples talked to them, asked them what happened. How you know? So based on what they have heard from the direct eyewitnesses, they have written down their accounts. So different people would have caught different details, and whatever details they caught, that is basically what they have written down. Let's just use one uh, example. Do we have time? Okay. Let's just use one one basic example. Let's say I, I ask all of you. You know, let us assume that I ask all of you to take out a piece of paper. And I want you to convey a message. I want to convey a message to Pastor Diana. Okay, And I'm saying, please convey this message to her in writing. And so I basically tell you that this is what I want you to say. Okay, This is the message I want you to please convey to her. I went to her house with some people. And when I went to her house, I saw her cat. Uh, you know, it was sitting in the hall. 
uh, in the middle of the hall. It was sitting on the mat and it was staring at something. And I was wondering what it's staring at. And then I realized that so the cat is staring at a rat. And I want you to con please convey this message to her. Can you please write it down? And you all sit down and you sincerely write down. You're all going to be, you know, if I, if I collect all of your papers and then look at what each of you has written, each of you would have used a different sentence construction. And each of you would have put in different details. Those of you who know the color of the cat would have probably mentioned that. Some of you would, you know, uh, would have asked for clarification. What is the size of the rat? And you would have put that down, you know, in your particular thing. So each of you would have come out with a different, you know, uh, different details in your writing. But this, of course, is just human writing. In the case of the divine scriptures, which we are talking about here, you see, they have collected details from the eyewitnesses. They have uh, been told, uh, you know, uh, things which they have heard from the disciples. All these things they have put together. But now they are not doing the writing on their own. They are being guided by the Holy Spirit to include some details, leave out some details. So uh, when we come to this whole thing about, you no, know, I've seen your hand, but I'll just, you know, if I want to finish what I am saying. Um, when it comes over here about some people seeing one angel, some people seeing two angels, just one verse that we can, you know, uh, look at, um, you know, that's, that would be in John chapter 20 verses 11 and 12 uh, if you could just read out that one thing you know we can just you know close this issue so john chapter 20 verses 11 and 12 but i reached outside yeah OK, so she is standing outside the tomb. She's not inside. She's standing outside the tomb. And she is crying. And she looks inside. And she sees two angels. What happened to the other ladies? Where are they? I thought they all were supposed to be inside the tomb, right? Together. And then angels, yeah, they either see the angels sitting or standing. But here you talks about her all alone outside. And when Jesus encounters her, where are the others? The others are not there. Only she is there. So I'm just assuming these ladies go over there and the body is missing and they are very concerned. And they start, I think they, they split up and went searching, searching for the body to find out where it is. And so different people encounter the angels at different points of time. Some of them see one person, some of them see two persons, some of them see, see, see the angels sitting. Some of them see they, they're coming back and forth. They're hunting. And so at different points of time, they would have come in. One would have seen the angel sitting. One would have seen the angel standing. They're kind of, you know, they're just summarizing what they have seen and they're telling about it. So which is why you have variations. But look at, the, look at this in interesting and important thing. When these four gospel writers are writing the gospel, they don't match stories and say, ah, let's all tell the same story. You know, let's polish up the details and let's tell the same story. They don't. They just simply stay faithful to whatever they have heard. And they faithfully record what they have been told. They don't change the facts. They don't meddle with the facts. If they were trying to, you know, um, cook up a story, they would have all told the same story. But they do not do that. They stay sincere to what they have heard. They stay sincere to what they have been told. And they just record it as they have received it. No meddling with the scripture done at all. And so this is one proof that there was no um, conspiracy behind what was written. They all frankly wrote whatever they were was directly given to them. No meddling with the facts at all. So we need to understand how carefully they revered what they were doing you know they did not take it lightly they were putting down facts about jesus death and resurrection and they did not want any um uh, you know any kind of wrong message to go out in the future so they were so careful to remain faithful to whatever they had heard and they just wrote it down as it is with the guidance of the holy spirit they did not try to um to to make it uniform, 
to make it look good. They left the controversy as it is. So we, you know, that that actually adds to the authenticity of what was told. Yes, now we yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. In the middle of a systematic theology, we'll discuss that later. Okay. No, it's just that it has nothing to do with systematic theology. So. All right. Um, okay, we still have a little bit of time. Um, so I, I hope, I mean, uh, you know, you're um, clear about the whole idea of inspiration. Uh, it was not dictation. It was uh, the they had the freedom to put put down things in their own words. But at the same time, it's not random putting down of words. They are being led uh, by what they have been told by trustworthy eyewitnesses, and they're putting down whatever they heard from the eyewitnesses. They're not going by what other people are saying. They're staying faithful to what they have been told, and they are being uh, led by the Holy Spirit because they are writing it by his wisdom. And so the entire uh, process of writing has been done most carefully. Just coming to one last point, you know, which some people raise regarding this issue. So maybe we can just look at that. Um, or should we move on into another thing in the last 10 minutes? OK, fine. Let's, um, yeah, fine. OK, OK. We still have about seven minutes, minutes left. Um, some people say that the Old Testament and the New Testament were written so many thousands of years ago. So how do we know that what we are holding in our hands today is accurate information? Maybe somebody changed it, you know, over the hundreds of years which were there, thousands of years which were there. Maybe somebody changed the original wording. So maybe what we have today is not really original wording. It's what, you know, some people uh, accuse. And uh, so they say that maybe the Bible that we have with us is not trustworthy. So how do we really find out whether something is accurate and trustworthy or not? We try to find the most ancient handwritten copies which are available. And then we compare the copies to see, are there differences between copy one and copy two? If there are many, many differences, then we think, oh my goodness, this is not really very trustworthy. This, this particular copy is saying this, 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 and this copy is saying something completely different. So then we say, oh my, this is not very accurate. But if all the copies are very, very similar with only one or two minor differences, then we think, oh, OK, looks like these hand, uh, handwritten copies were all conveying the same information, which means they were very carefully transmitting the details, which means no changes were made over the centuries, and which means we can trust you know, what we have with us today. That's basically how you know you uh, historians deal with all ancient writings. I mean, um, one of the most famous, important ancient writers was this na man named Homer, H-O-M-E-R. And he is supposed to have written these two um, uh, fictional writings. Okay, One was Iliad, and the other was something called Odyssey. So right now, there are 643 handwritten copies of uh, the Iliad which are available. You know, the rest of them are so ancient they got destroyed. But at the moment, there are 643 copies of uh, the Iliad available. So what do, what do historians do? They put all the copies together and they compare and contrast. They see how similar the wordings are in all of the different copies. And based on that, they try to decide the Iliad which we have today, is it accurate or not? And they and most people accept that the Iliad is very, very accurate. And they do it on the basis of 643 copies which are available. On the other hand, there are 5,500 copies of the New Testament available. And if you knew, when you match all the copies, you find almost absolutely no differences between all of the copies. The only differences you find are 
spelling mistakes in some places there are spelling mistakes and in some places you know there are variations like what we talked about one person says we saw one angel another person says we saw two angels so there are some variations like that and yes there are spelling mistakes in certain places but absolutely nothing which will affect doctrinal matters there is no variation between two copies where you'll think oh my goodness here it says this about doctrine and here it says this about doctrine no regarding ma doctrinal matters it's perfectly clear it's perfectly uniform in all of the copies it's only when it comes to spelling sometimes there are spelling errors because the people who were doing the copying maybe they got sleepy or maybe they got careless and so they copied it wrong but the, when it comes to uh, matters of doctrine in all the 5500 copies which we find of the new testament there's absolutely no variation so if you can trust the Iliad, which has got just 634 copies, and say that is accurate, why do you point fingers at the Bible and say, oh, this is so inaccurate. Look, so many spelling mistakes. Oh, this Bible is inaccurate. And also another thing, you know, this Odyssey, which, the, which this man wrote, the earliest available copy of the Odyssey, the oldest available handwritten copy is uh, 2,200 years after the original 2200 years after homer finished writing odyssey for 2200 years people were making copies 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 and after 2200 years when somebody wrote a copy that is available in our hands on the other hand the new testament 120 years after the death uh, and resurrection of jesus the first uh, you know handwritten copy that was written at that time is in our hands today we still have it with us today. Uh, it, it's only one, fra one a, a small fragment, but we have a copy which was written just 120 years after uh, you know, um, uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And all the wordings which are there in that fragment are exactly identical to the Bible that we have today. As for complete copy of the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, we have one copy which is... Um, 325 years after the resurrection of Jesus and the other copy is 350 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So if you can trust a book, you know, Odyssey, whose copy is 2,200 years later, if you can trust that, why don't you trust the Bible whose copies we have, which were written just about 350 years after the resurrection of Jesus, which means that they are that original, they are that ancient and that correct, and uh, they are available to us. So we have an entire copy of the Old and New, uh, Old and New Testament from 325 AD, and another entire copy from 350 AD. Those are the earliest available handwritten copies that we have with us today. And when we, when we look at the wording in that, and when we look at the wording in our Bible today, it is almost completely identical except for those spelling mistakes that I'm talking about and small variations like you know uh, one person will say that Ahaziah lived for um, this many years and another one will say Ahaziah lived because there's a small mistake over there and the number would have changed so very small errors like that it doesn't affect the doctrine or the teachings of the Bible in any way those small variations so we, the Bible that we have with us is something that we can trust completely all right um yeah if we had more time we could have you know looked into further details but then we'll close with this um so uh let's just assume there are no questions because there's no time to answer them let's just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for what we could learn uh today from this first session of systematic theology thank you O lord that um you have preserved your word for us so carefully. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can genuinely take the Bible and believe in what it says because uh, your people over the centuries uh, took the care to record your writings as accurately as they could and with your guidance. And so, O oh Lord, we know, we know that we can trust your scriptures today. 
And I pray, oh Father, that even as we read your scriptures, we would not only just learn from it intellectually, but we would also apply it in our everyday lives. Lord, we pray that even as we go through the rest of this course, even as we go through the different doctrines, you would speak to us. You would bring alive each doctrine to us so that it, be it becomes something that we can really personally apply in our everyday lives. You do that for us, Lord, even as we go through each of the doctrines. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much.